So Michelle Bernhard and Heather Brown and I have been working on the slam for many, many years. I think this is maybe the 21st or the 22nd. We had a big deep dive during COVID. And so we have 12 very, very incredible poems by your um, peers here today. And I just want to acknowledge and give them a big whopping round of applause just for participating. There you go. We could not do this without them. I also want a big, a big shout out to Rochelle Garfinkel, the librarian who is just amazing and supportive of us. So thank you. All right. So anyway, are you going to do a poem, Unza, today? OK, so Unza's got one, too. OK. So anyway, I am going to turn this over to the inimitable Colin Evans, who has been so enthusiastic from day one about this. And he is going to do the first poem. And then we're going to just roll the poems, give everybody a hand. In a slam, it's OK to snap or say wow or whatever while they're doing it. And um, just let's give it up for Colin Evans. Let's go, Colin! Dang, a lot of people here. Yo, what's up? Well, this poem I wrote um, doesn't really have a name yet. Um, I just wrote it out of spite, you know, um, but hopefully I'll enjoy. <clears throat> I'm tired. So exhausted that every word that leaves my mouth feels heavy with the weight of generations worth of trauma. I'm talking about gun violence and police brutality against black communities. How long, how long are we supposed to go on like this? I can barely breathe with the constant reminder that my life is not valued. When I was a kid, we learned about violence in school. They taught us about the war and the traumatic consequences it has on the human sight. But they didn't teach us about the war happening in our backyards. They didn't teach us about how the very people who were supposed to be protecting us were killing us. It's like there's a target on our backs. Walking out the house doesn't feel like stepping into the sun. It feels like I'm stepping into a war zone. White hands clutching weapons like they have the right to decide who lives and who dies. The color of my skin becoming my death sentence. People keep asking us to be peaceful, to sit and watch while we, they treat us like animals. But how can we be peaceful when the very people who are supposed to be protecting us are killing us? How can we be peaceful when they see our lives as disposable? We've been screaming Black Lives Matter since before it became a hashtag. We've been marching and fighting and dying just to remind the world that we are human too. But they keep forgetting. How many more hashtags do we need to create? How many more times must we hear the phrase, he was reaching for a weapon? Right before his life is snuffed out. I'm tired of the excuses, tired of the same old lines they tell us it's a violent world out there, but they're the ones creating the violence. They tell us that we're the problem, but they refuse to see their own reflection of the blood that they spill. Black people have been living in fear for generations. It's not a new thing. Our ancestors were slaves, and even slavery was abolished. They had the fear of being lynched. And now we're in the 21st century, and now we have the fear of being gunned down in the street by the very people who are supposed to keep us safe. It's time for a change. For too long, we've been living this cycle of violence. It's time for the people in power to listen to us. It's time for them to understand that we are not expandable. We are human and our lives matter. We cannot keep living like this in a constant state of fear. Black people deserve to live without the constant dread of being killed. We need justice and we need it now. The time has come for us to fight harder than we ever have before, to scream louder, to protest more fiercely. We won't stop until there's a change, until the people in the power finally understand that we will not go quietly into the light, into the night, my fault, until we see a world where black lives are valued and our humanity is seen. We're tired, but we're not defeated. We're standing up and fighting for what's right, and we won't stop until justice is served. Thank you.
All right, so for our next poet, we have a very enthusiastic person that everybody in the school should know, um, and that is Levi Armstrong. Thank you. This is a poem called Moms. Moms are the sun in our sky, guiding us with love and care, their hearts full of compassion, their warmth always there. They kiss, our, they kiss away our tears, they hold us when we're scared, they make everything better with the love that they have shared. Moms are the light in our life, their strength in never ending, their support unyielding, their kindness unrelenting. They teach us right from wrong, they help us find our way, their wisdom always with us every moment of every day. Moms are the rock of our family, holding us together, their love binding us close through the stormy weather. We are blessed to have them. Our moms are guiding stars forever in our hearts, no matter where we are. Next up is very talented Anisha Feliciano. This is, this poem is called How to Be Optimistic. Um, I look around, everything I have now is a blessing. My mind is saying I want more. Time's not ready for that yet though. I'm reaching for more, but my arms are too short. I have to earn what I want, not take things for granted. I have to be optimistic about what I want so I don't become stranded. I'd rather become stronger and more independent, focusing on what I need in the present in order to become the best version of myself. The future will always hold better things for me, regardless of any situation now. Always having my wants over my needs will lead me to a dead end. Patience is key, and life's just a learning game. Crush out now. Uh, all right, so next poem we got is Ellie Hiran Hiranadani. Sorry if I spelled that wrong. I'm apologies. Um, this is called I Wish I Could Write Something Good, and I wrote it last year. It's about writer's block. I wish I could write something good. See, I've got all these ideas up in my head, but every time I try to put them down with a pen, nothing comes out. I could think for ages, but all that'll come to mind are shitty rhymes and unfitting lines. Now I've tried different styles, of course, spoken word, pattern, and free verse, but, and I've tried narrative. Don't even get me started on narrative. Believe me, I've tried. I've tried like hell, but every damn line I write is burdened with useless metaphors, just as Sisyphus is burdened with his rock, no, my rock is my own uncreativity. I wish I could take this damn pen, drain the ink, and jab it through my skull, filling it with thoughts. Then when I'd write, maybe I'd write something I'd like. But if I had a pen filled with my thoughts, it'd hardly make any sense. Oftentimes you hear people wish they wrote the way they thought, but that would never work for me. See, my thoughts jump around like they're playing a game of hopscotch. My thoughts don't come out all pretty in poetry form. If I wrote the way I thought, I'd have, pages of, of, and I'd have pages upon pages of madness before a sentence of something with meaning. There's a reason that if you stick a pen through your skull, instead of letters coming out, you get your blood and brain goop. And no one wants to read a poem about blood and brain goop, don't they? Next up, Mr. Charlie Ames. Uh, this poem is called A Small Needful Fact and is inspired by A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that my grandpa still goes out and plays golf with his friends. Even after many years of playing in rough conditions, whether he's out playing in the scorching heat or the pouring rain, he still makes it out three to five days a week to walk the course and enjoy the day with his little group. 
Possibly, after his long days out in the sun, he enjoys to finish off the afternoon with a nice swim, slowly going back and forth across the pool with long and slow strokes. Perhaps it is likely that he enjoys to spend some days doing little errands, like going to the recycling center or making trips to the used bookstore, seeing if they have anything he thinks he or anyone else would enjoy. Or maybe he enjoys telling anyone who will listen about the Irish potato famine and how the average person would eat 15 pounds of potatoes a day. And while he may be getting older, he is likely to be one of the most thoughtful people I know. Thank you. Uh, next point, uh, give it up for Amanita Hidalgo. Hands. You gave everything for me. You lived for me. You moved for me. You were beautiful to me. I feel so, so guilty for what I did. I've begged for forgiveness, and you've granted it every single time. I feel so, so guilty. Have you ever been proud of something? Even when you know you shouldn't be? It's like an anxious conceit. It was, Eldritch feels weird to say, but it's like this smug, complacent abyss of contentment and pride and serenity. Like, I shouldn't be proud that I did this because no one else wanted it, but I am. I'm proud that I did this all by myself. And I'm so sorry for what I did to you. I know a moment ago I was talking to my hands, but now I'm talking to you, and in a moment I'll be talking to them again. But now I'm talking to you because it's hard to say exactly what I did. But it must have been bad because that is the only possible explanation. I mean, you don't, I'm just so sorry. And I love you so much. I feel so, so guilty for hurting you because you've never punished me. You give everything for me, and I risked everything just to hurt you. You're beautiful, that's what I'm really saying. I'm saying you, are beautiful and I feel guilty. Next up, Jude Murad. This is a poem about physics. Got to thank uh, Miss Padell for giving me a, the idea about this poem. The differential of the potential is the electric field in which you can wield the laws of physics, determining the lyrics of the universe in which we immerse ourselves. The precalculus determines the calculus, which is integral to everything frictional. The bath paves the path, and the derivative is all-inclusive and will derive the five forces of a world, minus one. The electricity defines the city in which we live and are captive to gravity, the cause of our depravity. We dwell in a potential well and are stuck. The electromagnetic force causes the kinetic energy, which cleverly includes velocity and peaks our curiosity. The magnet in the cabinet next to the circuit with a small time constant in which the ohms with less resistance than gnomes cause the charge to barge through the capacitor plate and it hey, it goes pop. Magnetic flux is the crux of the solenoid devoid of everything but the bee which gives the decree of the direction of the eye in which you can use our hands to justify. The, densely, the density is immensely important for lambda and begs the question, can the definition of pi help us quantify the dimensions of a circle? Yes. Go for our next poet, Avery Drum.
Hi, everybody. Um, here's my poem. It's called These Teenagers. Euphoria spreads a painter of misguided causes. Synchronized impatience, their good intentions like glazed eloquence. Their presence arises filled with judgment. Antici impatient anticipation grows, the desire to be listened to, but they are still viewed as inferior. They sit in the abyss of mass emotion. The pooled remains of modesty, their innocent view of the world cut away with every little reality. But values appear appropriately enough. Will our ideas about divisions of the present still make sense to speak? Next up is Quinn Xiang. Okay. I have always wondered what is at the end of the rainbow. Is there truly a pot full of gleaming jewels and shimmering gold? We have dreamed of seeing gold, but I know our love is the true glow. I don't have riches, but all my love for you I'll bestow. Should I believe in all the glorious stories I have been told? I have always wondered what is at the end of the rainbow. When I lay in the grass, I watch the sky. The clouds always move by so slow. I like watching rainbows, but the autumn breeze feels so cold. We have dreamed of seeing gold, but I know our love has a true glow. Sometimes I picture what our life would be like if we found that gold long ago. We would be in a beach house, our small apartment sold. I have always wondered what is at the end of the rainbow. I stand by you while birds chirp and bees buzz in the meadow. Though gold could buy us anything, I'd rather have your hand to hold. We have dreamed of seeing gold, but I know our love has the true glow. My dear, I love you more than you will ever know. Gold is a myth, and the truth is, I want to be together until we're old. I have always wondered what is at the end of the rainbow. We have dreamed of seeing gold, but I know our love is the true glow. Now I'll get up for our next poet, Alex Brush. Hi, uh, my poem doesn't have a name. Uh, it's about names. Names are given as gifts, handed to us from our parents, given to us from birth. The first thing you're known as, carried throughout the entirety of our lives, an unwavering representation of who we are. My name was not a gift. My parents got it wrong. I'm not who they claimed I was for the first 12 years. I was an imposter in my own name, my identity hidden behind what I was told to be, the labels pushed on me since birth, being told to be a girl. I was never a girl. From the moment I was given freedom, cutting my hair short for the first time at four, again at five, strangers calling me a boy, I was able to disguise this apparent girlhood, claiming like T claiming labels like tomboy the second I knew what it meant. I am still hidden under this falsehood of femininity forced upon me. Now it's not from lack of knowing, it's from fear. I am not named after a grandparent. I'm not named for my parents. My name was a gift given to myself from myself. My name carries the power I gave myself, my independence, my life, my childhood I didn't get as a boy. I am a boy the same way a tomato is a fruit constantly mislabeled, my identity debated, and much like a tomato is still a fruit, I am still a boy. People claim I'm a girl, saying because I wear makeup, the clothes I wear, my voice, then I must be a girl. I do not pick my clothes based on what gender they're assigned. I do not wear makeup to be a girl. I wear makeup because I like it. I wear crop tops because they're cute. I do not do it because I'm a girl. I am not a boy because of the clothes I wore or the depth of my voice. I'm a boy because for as long as I can remember, I've been a boy. Please do not classify me as a boy because I told you so. Please do not use he, him pronouns because I said to. Call me a boy because I am one, not to appease me. Recognize me as a boy the same way you recognize anyone. Do not do so because I asked. Do so because I am. Next up is Elijah Bacall. All right, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Elijah. I'm a 
a a senior. Uh, I do stutter. I, I do have a head jerk, uh, which is it's not strictly speaking part of the poem, but it is and it isn't right. It's it's all kind of part of the poem. So, um, this 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 poem. Well, uh, this poem is called "My Offer." My offer to you is simple: to live outside of yourself for a day, outside your body, for four easy installments of 1999. You'll look down at your shoes, and they won't be there. The sound of your breath, the exhausted whir and vague aching of your digestive tract, the faint burning in your sinuses from any number of overhot showers, brief and intense sleeps, forced laughs, the nasal quality in your voice that you just can't shake, like a nerd from a 90s sitcom or an eager newscaster out of his depth, that ineffable clingy dryness of hands, eyes, lips, ears, room, house, world. A queasy feeling filling your knuckles or toes just before they're cracked, and on and off ringing in your ears just loud enough to let you know it's there, and fade with an adjustment of the eyes for some reason. When you were little, and you asked your doctor, and he told you that the ears, nose, and throat are all connected, you could hardly believe him. But now it seems only natural, uh, doesn't it? To grow older is to toss great ropes from moment to moment, limb to limb, until we are all knotted up and can scarcely tell the patter of feet from a paying adjustment of stomach fluids, staid authority from debauched anarchy. There is a loneliness to the dim consciousness of childhood, that weightless existence, that weightless existence of speaking things into existence and then forgetting them, of running without feeling in the chest or legs, sweating without consequence. I'm sure that doctor listening to this poem right now has all sorts of has all sorts of all sorts of all sorts of all sorts of questions. Uh, but but uh, but ought he to? Can he explain your body, your face, your hair? My offer is not deceitful, and it is not obligatory. I want to give you this opportunity, this VIP experience, for just four easy installments of 1999. Call now. That was great, man. Love that. Um, our next poet is somebody that the football team loves, the baseball team loves. Give it up to the one and only Wesley Parent. This poem's inspired by Ross Gage's uh, small needful fact. A small needful fact is that I failed, and growing up, I was tricked to believe I could be, I could chase my dreams, and I could be who I want to be, until it was me, facing me, telling me that chasing dreams was not for me, and that I failed my younger me, my younger dream, and now I see the younger me was chasing more than just a dream. The younger me was chasing me, and who the world saw me to be, and now I find it clear to see. I never did it for the dream, I always did it for me. And with that, I find some peace. I can never fail to me. <clears throat> if all I do is chase my dreams, then all I do is chase me. And I will always be me, so I can never fail my dream. All right, so that is it for the uh, student section. Give it up for all the student poets. Very good job, everybody. Well done. So now we've reached the teacher part. Uh, so the first one up is an NHS alum. You know him, you love him. Unzabat, everybody. Oh, okay. Well, he's taking care of something. Suzanne Strauss. Okay, this is called Obsolete. I am a time capsule 
And when I am pried open by hammer or screwdriver or a random chair, kicked over by a wide-eyed preschooler, do not despair. I will not reveal your secrets for two reasons. One, you no longer have secrets. And two, therefore, I have been rendered obsolete. Today, or better yet, over the last decade at least, whatever can be maintained is saved in the cloud, hovering like a thick, rancid sponge that has turned metallic, like mercury rolling in a pinball machine, blocking out the sun that was once our birthright. And this ball of waste, developed and exploited by so-called individuals who believe in free will, yet simultaneously afraid to unplug, is bigger than the largest waste dump in the world, which, you may know, takes up 2,200 square miles around, appropriately, appropriately, Las Vegas, Nevada, a pinprick of excess, debauchery, and dreams. And this cloudy waste, this gargantuan glob encapsulating every potent and trite overwrought conceit wants to dump its load. The biggest turd humankind has formed, randomly smacking many of us eight billion destructive creatures with a torpedo in hopes that we will awaken from the torpor and see the true beauty of the world, nature, ourselves. Wouldn't it be better if it just rained a watery mist, a sprinkle, a downpour, the water cycle pure and unmatched? So while I can't claim that there weren't poisons in my childhood, we did look at each other across the table. When it rained, we'd run to the door unencumbered, no umbrellas or rain jackets or rubber boots, no device, forgetful, just laughing, 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 sticking out our tongues, tasting the first April shower, and it felt, and we felt, holy and connected to everyone who had ever enjoyed the first warm day of spring. Thank you. Our next teacher poet is uh, besides being my first period teacher, my um, one of my poetic mentors, uh, Miss Michelle Bernhardt. Thanks, Colin. Um, this is called "In the Moment of Writing." I'm an escape artist by nature. Relegated so many times to be a teacher, I really just love to read convoluted narratives. I would never change places with the high school student while she navigates her prefabricated teens, restless for clarity and collecting experiences to fit expectations. I discovered the paradox of the temporal, the structure in flashbacks. Amid the artificial obvious, I am no longer confused by should or by 2D representations of authenticity. I glimpse the, disp I'm sorry, I glimpse the diaspora within and know this moment is all there is. Thank you. Our next poet is Mr. Ty Holter. Hey, y'all. So I used to work at a, um, an art museum as a guard uh, where I got to stand, at, uh, st stand and stare at paintings for eight hours a day, which I loved, which, which may tell you everything you need to know about me. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, this is about one of the other guards. And it's called Ponte, named after the, the building. Somewhere in the pre-Columbian art, Nick took out his earpiece, which meant he was ready to talk. With this stuff, he rested the pads of his fingers on the display case and glanced at the cameras. With this stuff, no one knows when to stop dusting it off. From the adjoining room, the Spanish filigree and the silver and Jesus were peering in. 
Nick's hands had skulls and crossbones with the skulls bigger in proportion than they normally are. You get used to it, he said, even though I'm sure I didn't ask. Segways are the hardest to remember. A high up German curator came around wanting to see the latest pictures of his dog, Angel, ninth in a long line of beloved chihuahuas. Then a glint from the silver hit Nick and he jerked back pretending he'd been shot and patted his eyes as if to keep the joke going and said, if even one tile were to be lost from the building, the whole thing would be structurally compromised, which explained the skulls. Give it up for next teach poet, Mr. Isler. Uh, this poem is called Satellites. The universe expanding defies understanding. Bodies that seem fixed in place somehow grow apart apace. And though there seems a finite limit, space makes more space than sits within it. You were a spark once, nurtured an ember, then tended a flame now stoked, conflagrated into a full divine fire, a young star. Once nebulae, now sudden satellites, we crave the warmth of your rays. Floating, sands sound, almost unbearably cold when our axes tilt away. The universe, expanding, defies understanding, and you're a young star in it. And the spaces that space makes, makes the space between us. We're just two satellites floating in it, drifting apart by the minute, wondering if there's any limit. Uh, our next poet is Mr. John Suffrage. <laughs> Mr. Isler and I are the same height, apparently. <clears throat> I dusted this one off. It's from 2009, uh, almost before many of you were born. Uh, the voice in the poem is a father speaking to his daughter, in case that doesn't become obvious before long. I'll let you know that in advance. The poem is called Jellyfish. Early you ran to me barefoot over a carpet of wet star moss and jumped into my waiting arms. Over toast and jam you asked how a million leafy points can be so soft to touch and if anything in the world can eat a jellyfish. I proposed we build a sandcastle, but you said, no, a cathedral with stained glass and spires. We settled on an abominable snowman and later agreed he looked a little like grandpa. <laughs> After lunch, you napped on the daybed while I walked our stretch of beach. Once when you brought a boy home, I said you were too good for him. You asked if I knew anyone deserving. And did I have his number? <laughs> Touche, I said. We compromised on an outfit, and you went out for the evening. The sun set so quickly beyond the harrowed field, leaving us in half darkness, the smell of warm cedar planks lingering through, de through dessert. I tried to change the subject. After all, she is gone, isn't she? Early this morning, you kissed my head, woke me from a dream, let in some light. Pointing to the tray, I asked, what's for breakfast? Jellyfish, you said. Introducing our next teacher poet, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Yes. 
<laughs> if I try to touch it, it falls apart. Yeah. Okay, I dug this one out too. This is an ode I wrote in 2018 in the summertime. At the farmer's market by the sea, a rustic hand-sized square holding you under the tent, full sun. I thought you were only fresh in California, but the freckled girl said, you grow here just as well, but not for long. August can hold you for a week in the rustic hand-sized square. For a walk to the Crescent Cove, two skin-soft coral-colored fruits in the palms of her hands, another for sitting in the sand. How lucky we are, I think, as I bite into an apricot and look past her profile, rounded, peachy perfection into the sea. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you had a good time. Thanks to all the poets and everyone here. Thank you to all the teacher poets as well. And yeah, this is the NHS um, Poetry Slam 2023. Thank you. Happy break.